For centuries, dog-driven sleds were a lifeline across the frozen north, delivering medicine and other supplies to far-flung communities. Today, aircraft and snowmobiles have mostly taken over that work, and dog sledding has become a sport. And a well-made sled is behind every winning team. A dog sled race is an endurance test for the dogs, the driver, and the sled itself. A good sled is both flexible and sturdy enough to go the distance. At this factory, they make sleds from white ash. A worker angles the ends of vertical bars so they can be fitted to the sled's top rail and handlebar. These bars are called stanchions. He shapes the other end of them so they'll fit into grooves in the sled's runner. All the parts of this sled are designed to fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. A worker now screws aluminum rails onto the bottom of the two runners. He slides plastic strips into those aluminum rails, which gives the runners a smooth base for gliding over ice or snow. He secures the plastic strips at each end with screws. The crew is now ready to assemble all the pieces of the dog sled. They attach metal screw eyes to the runners. They'll thread rope through them when they're ready to tie the parts of the sled together. All the parts of the framework fit into notches made specifically for them. The location of those notches has been precisely mapped out. If one is even a fraction of an inch off, the sled would collapse like a house of cards. They measure the space between the runners to confirm they're perfectly aligned and now tie the joints together with nylon rope. These ties are called lashings, and there are 22 of them on this dog sled. Historically, lashings were made of moose hide, but nylon is tougher. They cut the rope with a hot blade, which seals the fibers so they won't unravel. They tie the midpoint joints together, and the focus then moves to the dog sled handlebar. A worker glues strips of ash together. The strips are thin so they can be easily bent, allowing him to curl the glued layer around a U-form. He clamps the wood to the form and the glue cures for three hours. It hardens into the U-shape, creating the dog sled handlebar. He secures the handlebar to the dog sled with the nylon lashings. The team then assembles the bed of the sled. They clamp the slats into place and then screw them to the framework. They install the sled's front bumper called the brush brow. Next, a worker cuts off the metal bead of a bicycle tire and discards it. He uses the remaining tire tread to create foot pads by wrapping it around pieces of thick plastic and screwing it into place. He installs a treaded pad on each runner to keep the driver's feet from slipping off. Then they install an aluminum bar brake. These pivot bolts will allow this bar brake to be raised when not needed and lowered to engage the metal talons. He loops a bungee cord on each side of a crossbar and burns off an end. He hooks the other end of the cord to the brake. The simple bungee cord mechanism will enable the dog sled musher to activate the brake. He heat shrinks rubber tubing around the base of the cord to protect it. They now weave the back of the sled using nylon cord to create a basket for carrying things. It's big enough to hold a tired animal. The worker then loops and ties the bridle to front stanchions beneath the sled. He forms a V as he threads it from the back of the sled to the front. He paints urethane onto the wood and even over the lashings. This will protect them against wear. It's taken about three days to make this traditional basket dog sled. And now it's ready to mush.
Athletic footwear dates back to ancient times, but the concept gained traction with the development of treaded rubber soles in the early part of the 20th century. These rubber-soled shoes were lightweight, comfortable, and hit the ground quietly, earning them the name sneakers. Design improvements have broadened the appeal of athletic shoes. People wear them everywhere. The athletic shoe has definitely gone Main Street. Using a hydraulic press, this employee forces a die through synthetic fabric to cut out patterns for the upper part of the shoe. At the next station, he punches out leather toe tips. The toe tip is one of numerous cutouts that add shape and structure to the synthetic upper. After arranging the tip parts on a non-stick tray, this worker places strips of thermal resin onto them. She drapes a non-stick sheet over the tray, then slides it into a hot metal press. The resin melts into the leather to stiffen and strengthen it. Another worker stamps the model number onto the heel cutout. Then it's over to the sewing department, where a worker stitches a reflector onto the athletic shoe upper. Other accent pieces call for more intricate stitching, so she arranges the parts on a computerized platform. The platform moves back and forth, allowing the needle to do a perfect job of stitching the accent pieces to the upper. This stitching would be difficult to execute manually. Once some of the more substantial pieces have been applied to the shoe, it's time to sew on a reflective logo, and the needle is once again guided by computer software. This athletic shoe upper is now ready for its resin-fortified leather toe tip. She stitches it in place, and then pieces together the collar, and sews it to the back of the shoe. She installs thick foam padding on the inside of the collar and then turns it right side out to tuck the padding neatly inside and hide the seam. Putting on the collar has obscured the top lace holes, so she clears them with a compressed air punch. Down the line, more computerized needles embroider brand information onto the tongue panels. The next worker sews a liner and padding to the panel, again working inside out to hide the seam. Another worker then stitches a fabric base onto the athletic shoe. She applies a rigid plastic to the heel. That adds structure and support to the back part of the shoe. Further down the production line, a worker tugs the shoe onto a foot form called a last. They heat it to make it malleable enough for this machine to pull it to the shape of the last. At the same time, nozzles apply cement to glue the overlap to the fabric base. Then a machine heats both the upper and a rubber sole. The heat activates glue applied to the sole earlier and also prepares the upper for bonding to that sole. They initially use manual force to press the two together. And then the shoe is subjected to mechanized pressure. Inside this machine, a rubber bladder expands to force the two together for a complete seal. The shoe then gets a foam insole with an arch support. The worker laces it partially and then pairs it up with the other shoe. An inspector examines the pair for defects. It has taken about 21 minutes to make this pair of athletic shoes. And they should be able to take a real workout.